Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Midday Live, coming to you from our studio here at Adesanwe in Accra. My name is Martin Asidu Dati. Coming up within the next one hour. Kidnapped Canadian girls rescued in Kumasi. Also coming up later this afternoon, NDC General Secretary Sebin Ketia urges party supporters to remain calm over the kidnapped allegations against uh, party uh, chairman Samuel Fusuan Pofu. And also in the bulletin, Togolese nationals allegedly conniving with basic school head teachers in Ghana to enroll non ghanaians on the Basic Education Certificate Examination Portal. And elsewhere around the world, police fire rubber bullets and tear gas at protesters in Hong Kong where anger at a new extradition bill has spilled over into violence. We have details of all these stories and more coming up, including business, sports, and entertainment. Thank you for staying with us. Do get interactive with us on our various social media handles. We'll be happy to hear your thoughts on our stories. Let's start from that all-important breaking news. Now, the two Canadian ladies who were kidnapped last week in Kumase have been rescued by the police. Lauren Patricia Catherine Tilly, 19, and Bailey Jordan Chitley, at 20, were rescued last night in Sawaba, a suburb of Kumasi. A statement signed by Information Minister Kojo Pong Kroma Wednesday morning indicated the rescue operation was carried out by national security operatives in the early hours of Wednesday, June 12. The statement adds details of the operation and ongoing effort at rescuing other girls would be made available in a press briefing on Wednesday. The two ladies were reportedly forced into a vehicle at about 8.20 p.m. on June 4. They had stepped out of the apartment at Silver Spring in Kumasi. One person, an Uber driver who drove the girls around town, was subsequently engaged to assist the police in the rescue efforts. A team of experts from Canada and the United Kingdom later arrived in Ghana to assist national security operatives with investigations. The latest development comes less than 24 hours after the Information Ministry had issued a statement dismissing concerns about general insecurity and a possible terror threat in the country. The statement, which was signed by Information Minister Kojo Pong Kroma, said Ghana's safety and risk profiles remained largely unchanged despite recent events in the sub-region. That statement was in reaction to security alerts issued by foreign missions, including the Canadian Embassy in Ghana. This latest incident, though good news, has led many to question why it has taken so long to find the Takrata girls and whether the police is putting in the same effort to rescue them. And let's stay on that subject a while longer. And we've been joined on the phone lines by uh, the um, Kennel Festers Abuaji. He's a security analyst on what this means for Ghana and its international relationship uh, with other countries. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Hello, Colonel Festa Sabwaji, can you hear me? We seem to be having a challenge with our lines there. We can hear Colonel Festa Sabwaji. We'd want to um, find out from him what he makes of this development. And clearly, uh, it is some good news regarding the fact that they've been rescued and uh, they are safe. That's what we are told. We are also told they are on their way to Accra for further examination. Uh, Colonel, good afternoon, if you can hear me. Yeah, good afternoon. Great. Uh, thank you for joining us on TV3. To start with, there is a th there are varied reactions regarding the rescue of these girls. In as much as that is good news, what do you make of the, the, the fact that we, there was foreign aid in finding them? That's from the UK and the uh, Canadian authorities. I didn't get you well, but obviously we should all be happy that we have found the girl and brought this incident to a, to a close, to an end, without any harm, I suppose, to, to the two girls. 
And as it were also to have redeemed uh, our image, both at home as well as uh, within the international community. Right. Um, the people who are talking about this have also raised concerns about why it seems the, there is a, a trend that if it's a foreign national that is kidnapped or abducted, our security agencies are able to find them. Talk about the Indian man, then there was an Estonian uh, diplomat. Now we have two Canadian girls who ha were also uh, kidnapped, but they've all been found. But the three Takradi girls who were abducted in 2018, August, have still not been found. What do you make of this? Well, I think, circumstantially speaking, those who are making that argument um, have um, grounds to, to make that argument. But otherwise, the cases involving the foreigners and the kidnapping of the foreigners and those of the girls are substantially different. In addition, we also need to accept that in the case of the girl, we compromise the information and or the intelligence. The moment that through corruption or otherwise, we allowed one of the key suspects to break jail for quite a number of days and to compromise whatever evidence that could have helped the police to have followed on the tail of the culprits a bit more speedily. Mm. So yes, on the surface of it, it would appear that uh, we have been quite proactive in arresting the perpetrators involved in the kidnapping of the foreigners and not have been too successful in the case of our own girls. But I think we need to give the benefit of doubt to, to the police in this case, to the extent that the police should also accept uh, responsibility mm. for having uh, compromised the initial stages of the kidnapping. Of and, the and staying on that same tangent, would you say that, um, yes, our security uh, apparatus has the capability to find the three Takradi girls, or it looks like now we need to fall on the foreign nationals to help us in rescuing them or finding them? Well, I've argued elsewhere that there would have been a certain extent to which the presence and the involvement of the Canadian experts, security and our intelligence experts, in the case involving the Canadians might have influenced um, the processes in finding the culprits. We're not sure of exactly what role they played, but I want to believe that in sharing their expertise and in placing at the disposal of our authorities some uh, amount of support, mm. uh, that would have helped. Although a greater part of the speed work, especially the operations to actually arrest the culprits, would have come from us. Right. However, we need to also recall that in the case of the Takwadi girls, we are already also receiving support from some of our foreign partners. Okay. But you see, as I've argued, the processes are different, the cases are different, uh, the dynamics are different. Right. And therefore, there is no room in drawing conclusions that once you have found the culprit involved in the abduction or kidnapping of foreigners, mm. the same can apply to, let's say, Ghanaian nationals. Okay. Right. We'd have to leave you here for now, but thank you very much for making time to speak with us. Um, uh, Kenel Festus Abwaji is a security analyst helping us understand the implications uh, regarding the rescue of these Canadian girls earlier. We actually spoke to Professor Vladimir Nchidanso, uh, who is a, relations, uh, a foreign relations expert and also security analyst, uh, before the, uh, the Canadian girls were rescued. This is what he had to say regarding how this would affect the relationship between Ghana and Canada. Our relationship, no. Our image, yes. Businessmen will be watching. Should I go? Should I not go? Businessmen in Ghana will be watching. Should I put my money here or take my money and go away? So it, it brings about some hiccups a little. Ours is not that robust an economy. If it were, 
you will see the the data showing or the market showing signs of hiccuping. But uh, our part of the world, we, we don't have that robust economy uh, having strong relationship with the outside world the way it should. Other than that, you will see we see the market indices just showing that kind of caution. And talking about why there seem to be the ability to rescue foreigners and not uh, the Takradi girls, uh, Professor Vladimir Chudanso asked that Ghanaians be patient with the security institutions because in such cases, patience is required. Patience. Yes, it's sad. It's, it's, it's unacceptable. But then, if you stampede the police, they will tell you stories. So you help them, rather, by leads. And then they themselves will start closing some uh, uh, leads, using new leads. Because look, in terms of crime detection, you need the patience. If you don't, you stampede yourself into arresting the innocent. And the law is an ass. The law, as we know it everywhere in the world, is, has a certain principle. It is better to allow 1,000 culprits to go free than put one person, innocent person, inside. So if you don't have your facts, you, know, you may arrest several people. That one is an example. We arrested several people believing that they killed the king. We believe that somebody was holding the shoulder, another was holding the head. So these are the people who killed the person. When we reach the court, no evidence. So you see, Patience. But then there's no amount of witchery or prayers that will bring them back apart from that patience that will lead us to the correct arrest of the persons who did that. All right, let's shift our attention to some other stories now. And the chairman of the main opposition National Democratic Congress, Samuel Fosampofo, has been granted bail after about five hours in police custody. Speaking to the media after his release, the general secretary of the party, Johnson Esedun Ketia, said that the chairman went through a series of questioning in relation to some accusations leveled against him. There have been um, attempts by the government of Ghana to use the security services to intimidate us in NDC and frustrate our activities. So we got to a point where our Council of Elders had to come out to declare that enough was enough. And that, from that day going, we are not going to respond to any frivolous invitations by the police. And that if they found anything against us, they are free to take us to court. So eventually, we began seeing newspaper headlines that uh, an arrest warrant has been issued by a court of competent jurisdiction. Uh, against our chairman. So we being a law-abiding political party called the police to come and confirm whether indeed there is such an arrest warrant. Because we cannot be relying on newspaper headlines. So we arranged and we met this afternoon. And indeed, they showed us the arrest warrant. And it was based on that arrest warrant that we reported to the CID headquarters. So um, they've asked all the questions they wanted answers for. They've searched the premises and residence of our national chairman. They've taken all his uh, communication gadgets with a promise, and we've offered to give them the password because we don't have anything to hide. And so based on that, he's been granted bail. We've given them time to scan all the uh, electronic gadgets. 
And if they are satisfied, they can, they can now determine whether they, they have sufficient evidence to, take, to proceed further or to, to declare the, the, the case null and void. It's been granted bail and we've executed the bail. So we are reporting here um, on Thursday. So that's the General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, uh, Johnson Esie Dunkitia, popularly known as General Mosquito. He's joined us on the phone lines now to uh, actually pick his thoughts on what he makes of this recent development and why the NDC is saying that there seems to be some political vindictiveness or vendetta uh, regarding the, the invitation that was handed to the, the chair of the NDC. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. To start with, um, why is the NDC, uh, and by that I mean you, because uh, you actually spoke to the media after the release of um, uh, Mr. Fusampafu, why is the NDC saying that there seems to be a political ploy and that the government is using the security apparatus to intimidate the NDC? Yes, but I believe everybody uh, who has a discerning mind cannot escape that conclusion. Because you, you have a situation where people have shot and named 18 of our supporters. And none of them, absolutely none of them, has been invited to the police for anything. And then the chairman of our party, who actually called for a withdrawal of the party from the by-election, because he, uh, on account of uh, securing peace, he rather gets arrested and charges put on him as a, as a criminal. We just cannot understand. And then as if that was not enough, every two weeks, you just jump up in the charge and then you, you put it on, on, on uh, uh, one of us. And so we have said that... Uh, we have come to the painful conclusion that the you know security services have been compromised and are being used by the the, the, the government to prosecute their political agenda and but, but general that general we're doing but, ourselves and the nation good service if we complied with those type of wrong uh, 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 abuse of uh, the state power that is why we have to uh, take the steps we are taking. We are okay. law-abiding. Anybody who is arrested will eventually be taken to court. G General Mosquito. We are saying that if we are invited to court, we will go. But right. to respond to invitations... Let, uh, let, me, let me come in here, General. Let me come in here. You are yeah. you're, you're saying that you are law-abiding, and by law, yeah. the security agencies are mandated to invite you if, for instance, an allegation is leveled against you to come and help them in resolving. And that's what we know happened. A letter was sent to the chairman and invited following an allegation they against him. They are abusing him. that power. You How have do you, you mean they are abusing it? It can be abused. So you cannot condone an abuse of state power. So what they are doing amounts to abuse of state power. That is why we have come to that conclusion. That these are people who have been uh, an organization which has been politicized. And therefore, we are not going to subject ourselves to that abuse. And it is the, the right of every citizen to resist uh, those type of things. Can similar accusation be leveled against the NDC when you are in power? Because under your, 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 your government as well, there were NPP people or people who uh, were of opposing political views also invited and in certain circumstances had the same reaction of... Of, of what you did yesterday with party supporters and all of them going to the party headquarters. Case in point, can it Japan? So can it, is so it fair happened? to say that the NDC also abused power? What happened then? You tell me. When they you... refused the invitation, what happened? Sorry? I said when they refused the invitation, what happened? Well, he was also arrested. He was picked up. That is Kenny Japan. And uh, so what happened? <laughs> what do you mean, what happened, uh, General? Because <laughs> what you are saying is an accusation no, that you... I you... am saying that... Uh -huh. I'm saying that this, uh, this, this uh, 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 you know, 
idea of always finding equalization and so on, that is what fertilizes wrongdoing. Exactly the point you're making. But General, saying, what, what then does that, that what then does that say doing, about we are not going to condone it. If anybody thinks that what we are doing is wrong, let them apply the law. And we are that is why uh, uh, we are doing what we are doing. But what would because you what would you tell your you what would you tell the electorate, the NDC supporters for that matter that if you are in leadership position and you are invited, yes. whether it's been an abuse of power by the security agencies or not, it is an invitation. Would you, by so doing, tell your supporters we a leadership of over 4 million not. people that if you are invited, do not go because it is an abuse? Please, don't, don't repeat what we have. We have said that clearly we will not respond to any invitation by them. So whatever invitation they will, they will, they will extend. The end result is that even if you go, they will process you for court. Let them send our charges to court. It is the right of every citizen to refuse to make a statement. It is the right of every citizen to, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, reject an invitation. So we have said that we will not ask. Honor, but but, but then it is also the right of the security agencies to arrest you if you refuse an invitation, isn't it? You cannot arrest somebody if he refuses to honor an invitation. Invitation remains an invitation. So we were we responded yesterday because we saw a court order. That was how we surrendered. All right. If you continue, any invitation which we consider to be wrongful, hmm. we will not respond to it. We are grateful. Because we are grateful. Uh, evil tribes, when the right people refuse to speak and stand up to confront it, Right. It is not about legalities because apartheid was backed by law, colonialism was backed by law, but we fought it and gained our independence. All right. We thank you for making time to speak with us. Um, the, the General Secretary of the NDC, Johnson S. Edinkitia, popularly known as General Mosquito, um, given his. We'll be speaking to a political science um, lecturer on this to find out whether or not it is even right for people in political position, be it in power or in your position, to refuse such invitations, what kind of message would they be sending to their followers? And in case in point, what happened yesterday? Chairman of the biggest opposition in Ghana with close to 4 million, in fact, over 4 million uh, uh, supporters. So if you are saying so, that it's an invitation and you would not go, this is not a type of invitation which is like a tea party or come for a chat. This is because an allegation had been leveled against him allegations of wild proportions that he's behind the infernos, he's behind the kidnappings. So it was actually only fair for him to go and um, clear his name. But that was not what happened. And as of yesterday, we're told that uh, the police got an arrest warrant. It was on the back of that that they went. We've been joined on the line by Dr. Ebenezer Ayenso. He's a political science lecturer. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for your time. Uh, good afternoon. And a little correction. I'm a historian, but head of the history and politics section. And politics section. All right. Th thank you. Thank you very much for that correction. To start with, is there anything that the, the, the common voter or the electorate or the supporter of any of these uh, political leaders can glean from their refusal to, to honor invitations like what happened yesterday? Uh, yeah, I, thank you and good afternoon to your listeners. I think, personally, I think it's a bad precedent and we sh should not be encouraged in this country. And being it that bad, do we have any uh, historical antecedents? Were there any sort of precedents, especially before the Fourth Republic? Uh, off the top of my head, I can't recollect, but... Um, I know if we go back uh, the post independence era, Kwame Nkrumah and the UP people, there were those issues of arrest here and there. And uh, at the system at the time I did not give room for someone to come out with impunity that I've been called by the police and uh, I'm not going. And from the records, uh, there was nothing like that. And, that could be attributed to the nature, the environment, the environment at the time, the political atmosphere of the time. 
which uh, before you realize you are picked. Mm. And if we come in through the evolutionary days, it's also the same thing that uh, you depict at dawn or wherever. Mm. But in a, a constitutional dispensation as we have now, I don't think it has ever happened. I mm. don't maybe have to check. All right. Uh, we'll have to leave it here for lack of time, but thank you for making time to speak with us and uh, giving your thoughts on the subject. Uh, Dr. Ebenezer Ayenzo is a, um, a historian and uh, head of the Political Science and History Department of the Institute of African Studies there. This is still Midday Live on TV3. Now, uh, there are those who are questioning the timing of these arrests or these invitations, looking at the fact that we are quite close to another electioneering year, which is in, in 2020, a few months to come. Is it right or is it wrong? Or irrespective of the political time we are in, when someone needs to be invited, he has to honor that invitation or otherwise he would be arrested. What are your thoughts on it? We would also be happy to hear from you because we are sure that you've been following all of these political uh, developments in and around the country. Let's speak to uh, someone who has, is going to give us a security perspective to this, looking at the fact that we are uh, going into an election. And uh, Richard Kumada is a fraud and security consultant. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, to start with, is this standard procedure if, for instance, the police believe that someone uh, either uh, has committed any crime or something is alleged against that person, is it standard procedure for the police to write to invite the person? Well, we are talking about a heinous crime and a serious one such as kidnapping, uh, which has been unresolved in this country, and uh, everybody is ag being agitated, and the police are saying that they are so conclusive and have done so much investigation and uh, they have come to a conclusion that one man called Samuel Apofo, uh, Samuel Ampofo, uh, irrespective of gender, irrespective of the political party he stand with, from where I am standing, the best position is to take the man to court because the two political parties, NDC and MPP, becoming their character and a party and join jamming up the police headquarters. Anytime any of their party big wings has been asked to come there, in particular, in this case, when the man has been invited twice and we saw what happened there, I will be saying that for being proactive or in terms of being proactive with the standard procedure, let's put the man before court and we'll avoid all these political issues. Dividing names are some political lines on a serious case such as kidnapping, which has taken an international dimension. It will not be good for us. So you are advocating that instead of an invitation and growing all this kind of tension, it should be straight to the judiciary, let the courts deal with it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think the best position from where I am standing, I'm not, I will not be pretending to teach the police what to do, but I'm just saying that in terms of being proactive and impressive with their investigations and the way they handle such issues, especially when involved big political people, NDC, MPP, who has the potency and ability to jam out the police headquarters. They should be sending them to court and let them still deal with the issue. In that way, the police will be concentrating on heavier matters such as what confronted on a daily basis. And forget about these political tweets and about NDC and MPP always raising issues about what the police does and how it is being done. It is the same two parties who never allow the police to be independent. And when it's happy for them, they are happy. When it goes against them, they complain. Let the police and the security agencies rise above policies and let the center be holding. Let us be proactive and let us be responding to the issues instead right. of being reactive. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard Kumado. He's a fraud and, um, a fraud and security consultant uh, helping us there. This is still Midday Live on TV3. Time now for the MTN video report for today. This is the OEB to a Bree Road. Look at the deplorable state of it. We are pleading with the government to come and construct it for us. When it is done, drivers coming from Tema Harbour and Ashaman can ply it to Nsanwem, Kofiridia, Kumase, and beyond. This is a citizen journalist reporting from Ibuatan.
would also be happy to get videos from you if you think anything is newsworthy in and around your community do send it to us on that number on your screens right now 055 stay with us there's more to come on midday live Thank you very much for staying with TV3. This is Midday Live on TV3. My name is Martin Nesiru Dati. To some other stories now, education. Information available to TV3 indicates that the owners of some basic schools in Togo charge junior high pupils, then in connivance with head teachers in Ghana, get the pupils enrolled on the basic education certificate examination portal for the exams. The headmaster of Kekeli Preparatory School at Aflau has been arrested for registering and allowing 62 pupils from Faith Mission International School in Togo to sit for the BECE. Selma Menya has more in the following report. Information available to the news team indicates that the illegality by some Nigerians and Togolese has gone on for some 18 years. Communities in Togo, mostly dominated by Nigerians, engage in the practice. As at 2017, there were over 30 Ghanaian curriculum schools in Togo that enrolled Nigerian citizens. They include Wisdom International School, Light of the World International School, Trinity Gems, Divine Knowledge, Holy Child, and Sylvia Modern Academy. These schools are affiliated to some eight private schools based in the K2 South municipality, with some of the Ghanaian schools affiliated to more than three of the Togolese schools. The eight schools in the K2 South municipality include Kekeli Complex School, Assemblies of God Experimental School, Freedom International School, and ECOWAS International School. The investigation was triggered by the campaign promise of the then presidential candidate Nana Kufuado to introduce free senior high school education from September 2017. The team felt if such Ghanaian curriculum running schools in Togo with foreign students were allowed to continue with their affiliation with schools based in the Ketu South Municipal to write the BEC, it will mean enrolling and educating foreign students with Ghana's resources and hence increasing government expenditure. Statistically, these schools have an average of 35 pupils per school that usually sit for the basic education certificate examination in the Ketu South Municipal. Once these foreign pupils sit for the BEC, they become eligible for the free SHS. 30 schools engaged in the illegality translate into 1,050 foreigners trooping to Ghana to enjoy free senior high education. Some have been duly placed by the Computerized School Selection Placement, CSSPS, as far back as 2016. What is more worrying is that these illegal businesses have taken a new twist following the ability of two of the schools in Togo, Sylvia Modern Academy and Sylvia Royal Montessori, owned by the same proprietress named Madame Enenna Samuel, had gotten her schools established in Togo registered under the Ghana Education Service. The school has been provided an index number whereby the name of her school in Togo appear on the basic education certificate examination of her past students. Having done all these, she has succeeded in mobilizing other schools in Togo to do same by devoting to help them acquire examination center numbers and currently advertising her plans to other school owners at a cost. Consequently, the structures and populations of these schools are good indicators that such schools in Togo and Nigerian students have prosperous future as far as their affiliation with Ghanaian schools in the Ketu South and beyond are concerned. Even though it is a requirement under the Education Act 2008 Act 778 for all basic schools to be recognized by the Ministry of Education, the Ministry could not readily confirm or deny that the 28 schools are on their list. And the last line of that report uh, brings us in studio to speak uh, to Vincent Eko. He's a public relations officer uh, at the Ministry of Education on whether or not they have heard or uh, had wind of this report and what they make of it. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, Martin. How are you? Very well, thank you. This is right. quite surprising. And has it come to the notice of the ministry? And 
while at that, is there any relationship of a sort between Ghana and Togo or the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Education in Togo, where people can what have exchange programs of a sort? Is there anything like that? Let me say a very good afternoon to your cherished viewers and to um, yourself. Um, first and foremost, let me indicate that there is an issue that has come to the attention of, first and foremost, WAIC, um, secondly, the Ghana Education Service, and the Ministry of Education as well. Um, let me indicate that by virtue of convention, for some few years ago, there have been some arrangement between Ghana and some schools that may not necessarily be in Ghana. And now that is how it happens. The school may apply to the Ghana Education Service that they will want their kids to write exams in Ghana. And what WAEC or Ghana Education does is that is either they give the approval or otherwise. Now when they give the approval, they allow the schools to, or they give the schools some identical ID numbers for them to be able to write the exams. Mm. Unfortunately, what we are seeing in the Volta region runs contrary to the facts that we have at the Ghana Education Service as convention, as, as it has been happening to other um, schools that are not in Ghana. Um, some schools in Togo or Nigeria may say that we think that Ghana and this examination council is doing well, and for that matter, we want our kids to be able to enjoy from um, the education the of like the, the, the Ghanaian system. But that is not what we've seen as far as the voter um, region case is concerned. And so um, it's something that has come to the attention of the Ghana Education Service. And my, India, my information tells me that the West African Examination Council is going to um, have a very good inquiry into it so that you will okay. be able to address the matter. So investigations are already underway. Absolutely. Um, the final question to this would be, if there is that kind of relationship of a sort to some schools, does that mean that those that write, be it from Togo or elsewhere, also benefit or will benefit from the free senior high school, which we are told is, a, is the reason behind a lot of the people coming into Ghana to want to write our exam? No matter, I think the problem is that if they register, they are not supposed to register as Ghanaians. They okay. are supposed to register as non-Ghanaians. Per the composition of how a student is graded in the BEC, the 100%, mm. one aspect is the cumulative assessment. The other is the examination itself that a kid writes, and that is going to constitute 70%. Yes. And so if the, that particular child or that school is not having the cumulative assessment, what it means is that of yeah. course, you're not going to make the 100 mark. And because the cumulative assessment is a prerequisite for you to be able to be registered mm. onto the BEC examination system, if you don't have that cumulative assessment, it means that whatever you are doing is um, ultra virus. So I've been issue on the face of the facts that we have, there is a prima facie case that the Ghana Education Service will have to be able to make sure that there is an inquiry into it, which why is actually doing that as we speak. Okay. Uh, it is still an unfolding story. We'll uh, monitor it closely, certainly in partnership with the ministry and then also WAIC, and keep our viewers and listeners uh, posted on that. But thank you very much, uh, Vincent Echo. He's the public relations officer of the Ministry of Education on that thank matter. Uh, that is still Midday Live on TV3. Let's turn our attention to uh, some business now, and uh, we'll be bringing you that shortly. And in business this afternoon, the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment and the Ghana Investment and Securities Institute have signed a memorandum of understanding to work together to enhance the Ghanaian investment and securities profession. Um, the uh, partnership will focus on qualifications, continuous professional development and ethics, and the project is expected to commence. Uh, later, they actually it commenced in 2010 and is going to be com completed in 2019. The project will combine the best of Ghanaian local expertise with the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment Global Standards. Director General of Securities and Exchange Commission Daniel Obami Tete outlined the benefit to be derived from the partnership. This whole collaboration is basically to deepen what we already have in terms of preparing people to effectively operate within the securities industry. With the adoption of this CC curriculum, um, if you have someone going through 
uh, there's something called portability. Uh, the person can easily travel to another jurisdiction where they recognize CC and can be allowed to operate. Of course, subject to um, understanding or appreciating some. The collaboration between the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment, CISI, and the Ghana Investment and Securities Institute, GISI, is the first in an English-speaking country in the sub-region. Chief Executive of CISI, Simon Cohen, explained why Ghana was chosen for the partnership. Uh, we think Ghana is a great place, and you have also decided that you want to move and accelerate much faster. So uh, the combination of you wanting to come to uh, use CII's international qualifications and we thinking this is a great location to do so meant it was a good partnership. At all professional levels, the CISI examinations will be accompanied by a GISI examination developed and awarded by GISI. This is something that everybody wins at here. You know, the Ghanaian people win because they're going to get better investor protection, because their people that give them advice and finance will know what they're talking about much better. They'll be quicker and faster and able to understand and explain how finance works, so that you'll be strong and able to fight on the international stage. The SEC boss on the timelines for the project. In a session where CC will make available their resource persons to train our local trainers. Now, after that has happened, then we will move into the adoption of the CC curriculum for, for the market. We'll begin to see this rollout at the beginning of 2020. I'm saying this because we currently have um, some of the streams ongoing uh, at the Ghana Stock Exchange, and they will terminate at the end of this year. The Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment is a non-profit professional body for securities, investment, wealth and financial planning professionals. That's it for the bulletin. Thank you very much for watching. There is more news on our website, 3news.com. Do have a good afternoon and as always, stay positive. Bye. For now.